Uh, hello everyone, uh, thank you for coming out today. Uh, pleasure to have you guys here, we're excited to be here. Uh, my name is Caesar. And, and I'm Alex. And we are Exercises in Medicine, your host for the afternoon. So we have a really good afternoon set up for today. We have a lineup of uh, insightful presentations given to us by uh, well-rounded and well-decorated individuals. Uh, before we get into the presentations though, we wanna do a quick overview of EIM, who we are and what we do. So let's jump right in. All right, so what is EIM? Exercise in Madison is a global initiative uh, created by American Air College of Sports Medicine. And the goal of EIM is to uh, promote physical activity as a means to um, treat or prevent the, um, any medical conditions in a health setting. Uh, we are moving towards this goal of promotion of physical activity uh, through the help of collaborative relationships with other student organizations, other student organizations such as Data Strong and the Kinesiology Student Association, better known as KSA. Uh, it is our hopes that through the, the help of each other, we're able to uh, arm the student population with knowledge and useful skills that can then leak out into the real world, into their communities, uh, their relationships, uh, their peers, their friends, work, so on and so on. All right. So now that we have a uh, general idea of the entity of EIM, let's take a look at the current representatives here at SF State. We have Dr. James Bagley, our faculty advisor, uh, whose hard work and dedication is the reason why we're here today. Uh, this whole event uh, is the reason, uh, he's the reason why we have this event today. Uh, super hardworking individual, we wanna thank you uh, for the hard work being who you are and being a great mentor and professor. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have, going down the line, we have myself, president of EIM, we have Alex here, vice president, my right hand man, uh, we have Chavez over there in the corner, uh, our treasurer, Jessica, who I don't think she's here today, but she's our social media manager, we have Kylie, who's our outreach coordinator, she's also like doubles as the office department head, and uh, we have our very own Patrick right there in the middle there, our lab manager, okay. uh, and yeah, so this is the team here at SF State currently. Let's take a dive into our history here at SF State. Okay, right, so the history. So there's a cool little story how EM started and kind of got reinstated here at SF State. It started way before COVID, but obviously with COVID, everything kind of got shut down and slowed down. And the story is not really mine to tell, but Dr. Bagley and our uh, old president, Jessica Roger, right here, they, uh, big shout out, they uh, communicated and they decided to, Jessica decided to come back to school and we started the EIM. And last year, uh, we uh, we all met, our core, core group of people we've met, we signed the Constitution, and last semester we had kind of had to ramp up and start uh, doing a bunch of things to get the EIM going. So a couple of events that we, cool events that we had was uh, World Day of Physical Activity, and we also presented some of the stuff on the uh, undergraduate research um, showcase. And so, this semester we have a bunch of stuff lined up as well. So like this event is one of the events we have. We also have some webinars uh, coming up and workshops. So stay tuned. You'll see on the pamphlet you have the social media QR code. So we'll show you the letter as well. So stay tuned. All right. So I understand this slide here is a little text heavy. Uh, if you know me, you know what I present. I believe that a picture is worth a thousand words. So my presentation usually have uh, more diagrams and bullet points. Uh, but I feel that this information here is critical uh, and should be accessible to the general population and um, everyone here listening today, right? So instead of reading all of this, I'm just gonna do a quick overview of the, the highlights. Uh, the CDC says that most of the US population is uh, not meeting the requirements, the <coughs> requirements of physical activity with a quarter of the population actually being inactive, all right? In the very bottom here, we have the recommendation of the CDC, which is 150 minutes per week with two days dedicated to uh, muscle strengthening. Now, what I really wanna like emphasize here on the left is that men and women of all ages can benefit from regular physical activity, right? And even more so, I wanna drill it in everybody's uh, heads that physical activity does not need to be strenuous for you guys to receive the health benefits of regular physical activity. It can be light, it can be creative, it can be fun, okay? Uh, now, moving on to the second half, so this is the part where I get really excited. 
Uh, this is a part where I'm liable to maybe ramble on for like 30 minutes or so, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna, <laughs> for the sake of time, I'm gonna try to control myself and uh, briefly speak about this. Alex mentioned that we were in the College of Health and Social Science Undergraduate Showcase, where we presented this poster presentation on the relationship between exercise and medicine, physical activity, and academic success. Okay, so what is academic success? That means that someone is getting good grades, they're motivated to learn, they're motivated to be a good student. All right. So what we found from the uh, literature is that there is an established positive relationship between fitness and academic success. All right. So what does this mean? It means that physical activity leads to fitness, which in turn leads to uh, increases in academic success. All right. And from these uh, studies that we uh, saw, I really want to highlight this one right here. Uh, Erickson et al. from 2011. This is a random controlled uh, trial. They took 120 elderly adults who are living sedentary lifestyles and they placed them in two different groups. One being an exercise, aerobic exercise, and the other one being a stretching only group. And this served as their uh, control. And what they found out over the year, the span of a year, is that the exercise only group actually saw a significant increase in the hippocampus, the left and right hippocampus. It was a 3% increase in volume. So what does the hippocampus do? It is a major player in uh, memory and learning. All right? From the literature, we see that hippocampal growth leads to the increase of BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which increases brain plasticity, and brain plasticity is how we retain and learn new skills and information. So, for the sake of time, I'm trying to control myself here. Uh, I'm just gonna do a quick three takeaways from, from this study. One, physical activity leads to fitness, which leads to increased cognitive performance. Two, men and women of all ages can benefit from uh, regular physical activity. And third, that, that big old uh, second bullet point right there, physical activity does not need be strenuous in order for you to uh, reap the benefits of a regular physical activity. And let me just say that the exercise group, what they did is they had week one, they had the uh, group walk for 10 minutes each week. They would increase by five minutes until week seven, where they started a 40 minute walking protocol. So week seven to week 52, because there's 52 uh, weeks in a year, uh, they just stayed at 40 minutes walking and they saw this benefit in increase in hippocampal growth, right? So it's a really phenomenal work that they did here. Uh, if you guys are interested in this, I still have this uh, literature, the, the references and stuff. You just let me know, I'll send that over to you guys. Uh, and yeah, cool, fantastic. So before we conclude this presentation, I wanna leave you guys with these final thoughts. Uh, this quote from Steve Prefontaine, an Olympic long distance runner. He said, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. Beautiful. So in the university, we learn to think critically, right? That's a skill that we learn here. And it's a skill that should be uh, ongoing for the rest of our lives. We should continue to learn, continue to prosper, continue to thrive. So I invite you guys to read this quote here, absorb it, digest it, come to your own conclusions. And, yeah, and as I mentioned on the past slide, we have our information. So if you'd like to uh, go ahead and scan the QR code that has our social media, our contact. We also have an email if you would like to contact directly. Get his literature meal and what all you one, but um, and our hashtag right up on Instagram and stuff like that. So yeah, give that a scan. It's on the back of your pamphlet. Take a uh, look at the pamphlet that has the uh, itinerary for today. Uh, if you like anything that me and Alex have been talking about um, the last five minutes or so, reach out to us, contact us. Uh, we're pretty friendly guys. Uh, we meet every Thursday at PIM. Uh, we're big on social media, we open the emails, and yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for listening, for being here, for your time. I appreciate it. You guys have a good evening. Well, I want to say uh, thank you to Dr. Bagley for having me here, and uh, thank you for such a warm welcome. Nice to meet, chat with some of you this morning, and uh, I'm excited to, to be here today. Uh, so I'm going to tie in some of the stuff related to uh, anabolic steroids and uh, some of the... Uh, 
type of technology that we can actually use to help and maybe uh, try to mitigate some of the side effects that may be associated with, with its abuse. Uh, but uh, I think I learned something new today, and I think maybe we should start a new hashtag, maybe like uh, Swole Hippocampus or uh, <laughs> Hippocampus Hypertrophy, something like that, right? We, we can start a whole new wave and, and uh, kind of implement that, but uh, really cool stuff. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, by the way, if you guys uh, are on Instagram, follow me on at Dr. Jeepit. Love to have you guys. I, I post a lot of educational stuff related to health, wellness, uh, hypertrophy gains, uh, body composition stuff. So uh, give me a follow. What we're going to talk about today is the prevalence of anabolic steroid use and the anabolic steroid use demographics. So who's using this stuff? Uh, look at the potential health risk with abuse of anabolic steroids. Uh, number uh, three is going to be to identify the factors that anabolic steroid use uh, and, that may contribute to the deleterious side effects. And lastly, identify the strategies that can be used to mitigate those risks. So the prevalence of anabolic steroid is, is actually, uh, it's an up and coming thing. It's actually becoming uh, an epidemic because uh, there's so many people that are abusing it. Nowadays, I see a lot of uh, teenagers that are actually put, uh, doing a lot of TikTok videos on this stuff. Uh, because they want the quick fix. So it's uh, very scary in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, so it's a growing uh, public health concern. In the USA, they say anywhere from 1.3 to 4 million people are actually using in the USA alone. That's a big number, right? So why is it so big? Is it 1 million or 4 million? Well, the reason is, is nobody's going to admit that they're using it. It's taboo to use it. It's hard to get some of this data. So depends who you're asking, how vulnerable they are, how comfortable they feel with the investigators. Uh, so that number is still, uh, put, a, put a little start asterisk next to it because we don't really know. But it's estimated that about 100,000 new users uh, begin using anabolic steroids in the USA every year. Uh, so that's a big number. Again, this is just in the United States, not worldwide. Uh, Long-term users usually use them for anywhere from five to 15 years. So it's not typically a one cycle thing it's usually a relatively longer term thing. <clears throat> Who is the typical user? Well, you may think that it's your, your sports guy, your, your uh, but it's not. Actually, research actually suggests it's a, it's a Caucasian male, usually about 30 years old, above average education, above average income. They're not really looking to perform. They're not looking to be competitive. They're really just, at the end of the day, they want to look better naked. That's really what they want to do. Uh, and they want to kind of expedite the process to, to be able to get there. Uh, but what we see is recreationally active age individuals between 15 to 24 are actually more likely to use anabolic steroids, more than athletes actually competing in sports. So the recreational gym goer, you're at your LA Fitness, your 24-hour fitness, there's a lot of individuals in that demographic that are kind of going into this, uh, utilizing the, the anabolic steroids. Elite athletes, that's kind of a, 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 I'm gonna say a difficult demographic to look at, but between nine and 67%, again, it's gonna depend. As an as a elite athlete, your contract for Nike is gonna be at stake if you're gonna be caught, right? So they're not gonna be giving away this information, but it is estimated that between nine to 67% of athletes are utilizing it. Remember, there's a lot of performance enhancement drugs that are not necessarily anabolics that can be used that are not detectable. For example, insulin, insulin growth like factor, growth hormone is very difficult to detect some of these. So they're not anabolic steroids, but they are performance enhancement drugs that may be utilized. Um, people that are attending the gym, again, it kind of depends who you're asking, three, three and a half to 80% is what the literature shows. Uh, we do know that men use more than women. However, that demographic is changing very rapidly. A lot of women are beginning to uh, utilize some of these performance enhancement drugs. Uh, bikini competitors uh, that, that you see, uh, some of those gains are not necessarily just from hard lifting and, and good eating over time. And you actually see that women are getting stronger, not only because they're strength training, that's obviously part of it as well, but some of it comes from the performance enhancement benefits of, uh, of the, the anabolic steroids. Uh, but the highest prevalence of users is actually in weightlifters, the powerlifters, and the bodybuilders. Of course, uh, a lot of these are in untested federations. So uh, in, in bodybuilding, for example, there are tested federations. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that cheat in some of those federations. They say they're natural, but they're not. And it's pretty easy to cheat the test. But there are actually literally untested federations where they don't test at all. So it's one of those, they just look the other way. Uh, and the same thing in the powerlifting world. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, organizations where they won't test at all, and then there are others that are actually tested. 
And then the testing, remember, testing's expensive. So uh, it's gonna cost organizers a lot of money and organizers are in, in the game to make money. So to do drug testing is not gonna necessarily uh, increase their bottom line per se. <clears throat> so what are some of the effects of anabolic steroids in non-sexual related tissue? So I highlighted a few of them here uh, and because this is gonna lead into the, the focus of health here. So what we see is, we see an increase in cardiac tissue mass. Actually, my talk in the side effects is gonna be focused on uh, if, uh, cardiovascular effects because we can talk about liver, we can talk about kidney, we can talk about brain, but I think the biggest uh, number one line that I like to focus on is the cardiovascular because that's what we see the most of and the issues that we typically see. Uh, so they can stimulate growth to the epiphyseal plate. So obviously if you're a teenager, uh, it may stunt that growth in that regard. Uh, increases in erythropoiesis, hemoglobin, and hematocrits essentially might make your blood a little bit thicker, increasing your chances for stroke and other type of conditions, and that's something that should be monitored, but a lot of these people are not monitoring that over time. And then it is gonna increase lipolysis, that's the good side, right? Uh, so you're gonna increase fat oxidation, but number two, it's gonna also uh, increase the low density lipoproteins, and it's gonna de uh, decrease the high density lipoproteins, which is, not a good component for your cardiovascular system. So before we dive into some of these studies, I'm gonna highlight a few studies. I wanna just do a really quick and dirty uh, physiology of the heart, so, so we can kind of get some terminology. So that way when you see the results of some of these studies, you can figure out uh, what they're actually finding. So the first thing that we wanna look at is left ventricular ejection fraction. And what this actually means is the amount of blood that the heart pumps with each beat in the left ventricle. So uh, and with each beat, this is an, an important measure. Typically, we want to see at least 50%, but once you reach below the 50% or, or approaching 50%, and really 50 to 55% is kind of encroaching on the, the I'm going to say the, the yellow flag. Once it goes under 50%, it's kind of a red flag. Ideally, you want to be maybe 55, 60, 60, 65% of that ejection fraction. So this is a measure that we typically see. And to, to actually measure it, you use... Uh, an echocardiogram, and then they actually look at the stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume times 100, and it gives you your ejection fraction. Number two is the EA ratio. So this is a marker of the function of your left ventricle. So if you have abnormalities in this ratio, it's gonna suggest that the left ventricle cannot fill properly with blood between those contractions over time. Uh, so this is measured with flow velocities across the mitral valve using a pulse Doppler. So this is again, uh, echocardiogram that, that is utilized for this. And then it's a, it's a ratio of the peak velocity of, of the flow from the left ventricle uh, in early diastole, that's the E wave, so that's your numerator, divided by the peak velocity flow in late diastole caused by the atrial contraction, that's the A wave. Uh, so that's a ratio that we're gonna look at that's important. And then the last one is gonna be left atrial volume where an increase suggests that there's actually some structural cardiac remodeling that is going on in the heart, which is not necessarily a good thing. This is usually in response to some chronic pressure uh, and volume overload. For example, diastolic uh, dysfunction, left ventricular hypertrophy or hypertension is gonna create that load. And then this is something that we can monitor over time. So here's actually the EA ratio assessment. Uh, so you can see what the, uh, the mitral valve E velocity is, is 108.4 centimeters per second. The mitral valve A is uh, gonna be um, the 62.27. So if you divide 108 by 62.27, you're gonna get that EA ratio of 1.74. And here you see the E wave, and here you see the A wave. So this is what it looks like in the echocardiogram. Now let's look at some of the studies that have actually identified some of this stuff. So in this particular study, they took 31 physically active men, average age of about 33 years old, uh, and they were intending to start their anabolic steroid cycle. So this is not prescribed, this is people that are gonna just do it anyway, right? Um, and they just got these individuals. 87% of them had previous usage, so only 13% of them were actually first time users. Uh, and of course, the, the investigators didn't provide the drugs, that was up to them to do it, okay? Uh, they performed a comprehensive 3D echocardiogram before they started the cycle. Then they did it at the end of the cycle. They didn't dictate how long the cycle was. They let the individual decide, do you wanna do an eight week cycle, 12 week cycle, 40 week cycle, how long do you wanna do it? Uh, they didn't dictate the dosage or what drugs they're using. And then they did it one year after they stopped the cycle, okay? The median cycle length was about 
four months, okay, so 16 weeks, but the range was from seven to 42 weeks, okay, so some of these guys are going on almost for a full year, okay. The mean number of anabolic steroid use, polypharmacy is very common, four anabolic agents are being used. The range from one to 11, so some individuals are taking as much as 11 anabolic compounds uh, during this uh, process. Uh, and then the average dosage, 904 milligrams per week with the range ranging from 250 milligrams up to 3.3 grams, okay? So this is huge, huge dosages. Just to give you a level of reference, testosterone replacement therapy at the very high end is about 200 milligrams a week. So look at how much above they were actually taking, okay? So this is way super physiological dosages. Uh, what happened between T0 and T1? So the 3D left ventricular ejection fraction decreased by 4.9%. EA ratio decreased by 0.45%. Uh, the 3D atrial volume increased by 9.2 mLs. We already went over the physiology of what those means, right? So this is what occurred. Uh, the left ventricular mass increased by about 28.3 grams. So now we see that left ventricular hypertrophy occur just in this short occurrence over a four month period, but on average. Um, however, after about eight months of cessation, these markers did return to baseline. So to say if you do a cycle, it's not gonna necessarily be the end of the world. You, typically you don't die from anabolic steroids from a one-time use acutely. It's very, very uncommon. It's gonna be cumulative over time, over the years. But what did we say was the average use for the anabolic steroid user? Five to 15 years. So this is where the problem kind of compounds it, it over time. Uh, that the conclusion we see that left ventricular hypertrophy, we see impaired, impaired systolic and diastolic function, and then we see those structural changes. This other study was very good. Uh, this was a cross-sectional cohort design with 140 experienced weightlifters. 86 of them reported they had been using anabolic steroids for more than two years, and 54 men were actually non-users. They used the echocardiogram, coronary uh, CT angiogram to assess less ventricular ejection fraction, the left uh, uh, ventricle diastolic function, and then the coronary atherosclerosis. And this is one of my favorite graphs because you can actually see what happens with these individuals. So they grouped, these are the non-users here, and these are the users here, but you can see what happens when they're on the drug and then when they're off the drug. So here is the ejection fraction. Let's focus on that. Uh, and the ejection fraction, remember what I said, if you're, if you're under 50%, that's a red flag. If you're under 55%, kind of a yellow flag. But look at the non-users. None of them are, they're actually over 60% on average, right? And then look at what happens when you're on cycle. Uh, and look at the little dots where you can see some of the distribution. So look at what percentage of those people are actually way below. Look at that ejection fraction in the 40s, in the 30s even. Right, so this is quite scary. Uh, and you can see that most of them are below the threshold when they're on cycle. And then even when they come off, it does come up a little bit, uh, but it's still significantly lower than the, uh, than the non-users over time. And these are all weightlifters, by the way. Um, we see a similar trend here with the early diastolic left ventricular tissue velocity. Um, so at the end of the day, we see different things. We see the anabolic steroid uses, they actually have higher coronary artery plaque volume and non-users. Uh, lifetime of an anabolic steroid use is strongly associated with that uh, atherosclerotic burden. Uh, and then therefore we see some potential uh, abuse can lead to myocardial dysfunction and accelerated atherosclerosis. The raw system is partly to brain, blame for all of this. So uh, the renin, angiotens uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system is one of the major contributors. So even, even in healthy individuals who have pathology, the ROS system is typically elevated. And you can see when this is elevated, it's gonna to lead to hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and then all the way it's gonna to end to heart failure and end stage uh, heart disease. So chronically over time, it's something that we actually wanna control. What happens with anabolic steroids, as this study showed, is guess what it does to the ROS system? It increases over time. So uh, this is one of the things that occurs when you're taking the anabolic steroid, ROS increases, and then it's gonna lead to this cycle of things over time. So when it's chronically elevated, you're gonna have some problems. <clears throat> this other study actually shows the, the relationship between HDL and L LDL. 
So again, LDL increases, HDL is gonna decrease over time. And then it goes specifically in different types of particles and, uh, and how it actually specifically targets the, the particles that we don't want uh, to, to increase. So uh, this, this can become an issue. And at the end of the day, you're gonna basically see uh, different issues in the cardiovascular system, as I'm gonna show you in one of the slides. Some of the other things that we can see from this particular study is Chronic use can contribute to higher levels of visceral fat, which is another contributing factor to other cardiovascular diseases. Again, cessation can restore the normal lipid levels, but once you stop, you're gonna have other potential side effects, such as withdrawal symptoms like depression, hypogonadism, which are gonna be in themselves a risk for cardiovascular disease. So here's that relationship between anabolic steroid abuse and the coronary plague. So this is the cumulative use, and you can see if you use it for one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, there's really not a large increase. But a start, like once you start going to that five, six, seven year mark, you now start seeing that, that relationship start to increase over time. So this is one of the issues, it's, it's, it's cumulative. So it's gonna take time for it to get you there. Yes? Can I ask a question? Sure. On the previous slide, you can look at that. This one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. When I look at that, those are the individual points, right, of the people. Yes. Uh, is there any difference if you segregate the people out who are the high ones, because not all of them go up. What is the difference between the two groups? Yeah, I, the, the, the paper did not show that, so I would not be able to answer that question, but I think it would be an interesting sub-analysis to look at, because you're right. There's not, and I'm gonna kind of address that in this next slide in the sense as to why that is. So what are some of the factors that may lead to the deleterious side effects? A big one right here is this guy, your genetics. At the end of the day, you're gonna have some people who can take a lot of drug and they don't have any side effects. They're totally fine. Just like the people that can smoke for 40, 50 years and they don't have, they don't have lung cancer, right? You have those individuals as well. So, uh, and then there are people that can maybe take just a little bit and it goes a long way. Right? And then there's people that can take a lot and it doesn't affect them. So this is why you see so much diversity in, in some of these cycles. So that's why not everybody dies and, and, and it's not necessarily dangerous for everybody. It's kind of an individualistic approach. So uh, again, it's what you're exposed to, what your body can handle, uh, and this is what we see. Obviously, other things are gonna affect this, your, your healthy lifestyle, what drug are you using or what drugs are you using, um, how long are you using them for, and obviously your dosage. So these are, you can obviously manipulate your genetics, but hopefully you can see how these drugs are affecting your genetics uh, and, and, and your, your responses to these different systems, which is why the importance, I'm gonna kind of lead into this part here. The first thing you wanna say as a practitioner is don't use them, right? But just say no doesn't always work, right? As a physician, you're gonna have people with diabetes who are not gonna manage their blood sugar. You're gonna have people that are obese who are gonna stay obese, right? So we have to treat the individual. Just say no does not work. And this is why anabolic steroid users and gym goers hate to go to the doctor because they just tell them, just don't use it, right? The reality is some of them are going to use it. So now we have to take the next step. So maybe avoid abusing it. So maybe use it, maybe just use a little less and let's monitor these health biomarkers over time. Um, so of course you want to do the educational part and try to get them to not use it, but that doesn't always work. Um, so make sure you get adequate sleep and nutrition. Make sure that you're doing resistance training. A lot of people are doing this part, uh, but unfortunately, Jimmy and I were talking this morning and there are people that want such a shortcut. It's like they're lifting twice a week and they, they're doing the drug. It's like, what about doing everything else right first? Like, how about strength training four or five days a week with a progressive persistent overload? How about being consistent with your diet, getting enough protein, getting enough calories, getting enough sleep? How about you do all that first before you try this shortcut? Because to me, if you're gonna choose to go this route, this is the icing on the cake and the drugs are only gonna work and get maximal benefit when you're doing all the other things right. Doing the drugs first is the shortcut and if, if you're doing the other things wrong, you're not gonna get the same benefit. Um, you're gonna get a lot of side effect though. Minimizing alcohol and avo avoiding recreational drugs. So I think that's one of the, a lot of people, especially young people, uh, they're gonna be doing the anabolic steroids and they're getting wasted three, four, five days a week. Awful, right? So for your gains and muscle gains and for 
uh, if everything else, because now you're you're now having other issues that are going to be uh, coinciding with your with your anabolic steroid use. Uh, maintain healthy body fat levels, so this high levels of fluctuation is not ideal. Uh, seeking guidance from your medical doctor, so you should see your medical provider one to four times a year. I recommend typically for for users to go at least three about two to three times a year uh, and get regular blood work done. You can also check your blood pressure on a regular basis, so that way you have uh, your own data as to how it's affecting your blood pressure over time. Uh, and then if you see elevations in it, go see your doctor and see what can be done. Maybe check your fasting blood sugar uh, one or two times a week and see what that is, because that can creep up into elevations over time, and you can monitor that yourself very easily. So. With your doctor, this is what you need to do. Probably get fasting blood work three to four times a year. Make sure that your, your insides are working. So what kind of uh, tests do we need? So you can do a comprehensive metabolic panel, complete blood cell count, a lipid panel, HbA1c to look at your, your average blood count uh, for, your, for your blood sugar, PSA test, looking at homocysteine levels, lipoprotein uh, A, uh, pillow lipoprotein B, those are all good biomarkers that you can keep track of and see what is going on. Um, next, you can get an annual, or at least every other year, get an EKG, get an echocardiogram, get the coronary calcium scan, and then you can see what is happening over time. Because that alone, if you have those data points, and I don't care who you are, if you see yourself kind of going in the wrong direction, that might scare you enough where you can see it. But people are going blind, and then you have these 20, 25, 30-year-old people that are abusing the stuff blindly, and then they look great on the outside, but the inside is rotting, right? So we, these are, this can at least kind of keep you on track. Um, and then manage the risk under medical care. So there are drugs that you can utilize that should be utilized under medical supervision. So for example, you could utilize uh, uh, Telmisart, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker. That's gonna decrease that ROS system, and it's gonna keep it more under control to mitigate some of those risks. Uh, it may also ask as a PPAR agonist for glucose management, because we know that glucose management may be impaired. Uh, you can use cholesterol medications to keep your cholesterol under control if needed. Um, or you can even use a uh, vasodilator like Cialis, because that can actually help in, in uh, improving blood pressure uh, over time. So those are some other drugs that can be implemented, but again, not on your own, under medical supervision when indicated with the right dosages. And that is my talk. Yes, sir. You mentioned genetics and that some people have the genetics to take steroids and not get these side effects. Is there is it the DNA methylation test or what test is it that someone needs to get in order to see those specific markers? Yeah, I don't think that we have one identified. I think the best way to do it is just work with your, get all of these tests done and see what's going on. So I mean, remember, there's, there's very little literature on this. You know, like the US Army is actually doing a lot of investigations on anabolic steroid use for performance enhancement for the soldiers, right? Under different conditions. Uh, and they fund a lot of this research. Uh, but they're not using these dosages, they're using much more moderate dosages. So it's hard to tell, but if you're, if you're using this stuff, well, just like in, even in hormone replacement therapy, you should get that regular blood work done, look at your EKG, look at your echocardiogram, and then see what effects are having, and then you can titrate the dosages effectively if needed, and you can maybe change the drug, change the dosage, or maybe you realize, hey, like the, the benefits are not outweighing the risks, right? So at that point in time, maybe this drug isn't for you, and then you need to change. So I don't think we have specific tests. I think you need to do it on an individual basis. And that's why I advocate if you're a physician or you're working with, with patients, uh, you can advocate to get them to get these clinical tests done and then they can keep their own data over time. Yes, sir. Well, the concept is great to keep, in terms of doing the testing, at least for a number of people, those are significantly expensive costs. And therefore, you know, most likely they will not do it. Is there any, if you think of any marker you can use for them, which would be very simplistic, they can use, which would be zero cost. Yeah, I think to me, because you're right, those, those are very costly. And this is actually one thing that I often tell individuals. Because sometimes people that are, that are trying to dabble into this stuff, they just think of the cost of, like, I'm going to say uh, an aspiring bodybuilder, right? They're going to they're, they're gonna think of the cost of the coach, the cost of the food, the cost of competing, traveling maybe. 
but the cost of the drugs is, themselves can be very expensive. Because remember, these are underground drugs, so they're, they're very hard to get. The quality, that's a whole other issue. But then now, what they don't budget for is the medical cost for this stuff, right? Insurance companies aren't gonna cover an EKG and an echocardiogram, plus, especially if you're 28 years old. They're, they're not gonna do it. So typically, you're gonna have to pay for it out of pocket, right? Which gets to be very expensive. So to answer your question, some of the things that you can do very easily is simple blood pressure. Check your blood pressure over time. Uh, you can actually check your, your blood sugar over time, right? So, and then maybe some of the basic lab tests. So you don't maybe need to do the ex a comprehensive lab test. And there are actually um, private labs that you can actually pay and it's fairly reasonable. Um, and you can actually get some of this blood where you can look at, for example, uh, what's your red blood cell count, what's your hematocrit count, and then see what's happening on some of those levels. Because I've seen a lot of people in the lab, I test a lot of individuals for body composition stuff, and when they come into the lab, they're eight, 12, 15 weeks into their cycle, and their blood pressure is through the roof. We're talking guys that are 28, 29, 30 years old that have no reason to have elevated blood pressure. So that's an easy one. Um, on the previous slide, all the tests that were laid out, I was thinking, I'm a pretty healthy, middle-aged guy, I still don't go to the doctor very much, and you know, going to the doctor is, let's say 30 or 25, if I was to ask the doctor, I want these tests, they would ask me why, right? It would probably be the, the, the question. And so that would lead me, if I was in my 20s, to be a little reluctant to ask for these tests. Do you have any suggestions for ways to ask for these tests to be, happen to minimize that you know, social ch challenge, as well as just maybe promote this, that, that obstacle? No, I think that's very important. And I think to me is, the key is telling the truth to your healthcare provider is something that's very critical. And if you can't do that, you need to find a new healthcare provider where you feel comfortable doing that. Because if your physician is judging you, right, they, they should educate you. But if they're judging you and they're not treating you, that's a whole different thing. So my, my, my thing is, is find a new doctor, right? And uh, of course, it can be difficult depending on insurance and you know how much money you have. I mean, so that becomes a whole, a whole disaster, but uh, I think that's that's the best answer that I have is you know just try to find a physician that you can trust to be able to do that. And, and there are a lot of physicians that do some concierge type medicine. I mean, it's still costly, but uh, at the end of the day, it can be uh, you know somewhat affordable. You can pay like a thousand dollars a year, uh, and then they can they can kind of oversee some of your things. So still a thousand bucks, but I mean at the end of the day, it's your health. So that's kind of if you're a coach. This is one of those things, it's like, hey, if you can't invest in doing this, it's kind of like buying a BMW or a Mercedes and you can afford the car payment, but then you can't afford the oil change and you can't afford when the tire breaks. It's the same thing with, with the anabolic steroids, right? You, you really, if you're gonna go that route, you, you better be able to have it. One more question. Okay. Um, I'm just curious to think of if there's any potential of cross-pollination kind of between the Yeah, and I think it's I think that's part of a, a misnomer I'm going to say because I think I think it's been used for a long time. Uh, I mean, if you look at the history, and I'm not a historian, but if you look at the history of some of this stuff, I mean, uh, in even even in the early Greek games, they were trying to use you know find ways to, to find find a, a, a shortcut or a, or, a, or an edge. It's always been in the culture because at the end of the day, it's the, the culture's to win at all costs. Uh, so I think it's just a misnomer uh, and kind of like a, I'm going to say a. Uh, a wishful thinking that that's kind of the case. I mean, at the end of the day, and people pay for the performance, right? It's like people might want to say, but at the end of the day, we want to see 100 home runs hit. Yeah. We want to see somebody run the, the 100 meter dash in you know nine seconds flat, right? Uh, people like to see that, but they, they don't always like to see what it takes to get there. Mm -hmm. right. Hello, my name is JJ Wallace. I'm a professor of uh, health and exercise science at Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky. And I'm very happy to be here with you today and share one of my passions, which is virtual reality and the metaverse. And so the talk today is, is the metaverse our new reality? And if so, here's what you need to know. And I've really geared this, hopefully, to our discipline and how we, as kinesiologists, health and exercise scientists, future healthcare professionals, can really use this technology, not just for educational purposes, but for research purposes and practical. So just to get us all on the same page, 
the metaverse. What is it? The metaverse is a virtual space where users can interact together in a computer-generated environment. How many of you have been in the metaverse or been in a virtual reality space? A couple of you. Well, metaverse is new. It's not something that has been around for a long time. We have metaverses that have been around a while, but they are on 2D space. So when you think about virtual worlds like Fortnite, uh, Fortnite is a game, is a metaverse. It's a, its own little world contained. People can interact together, but it's in a 2D space. So what I'm actually talking about today is not that 2D space that you think about on the computer, but what we call extended reality. And extended reality is different than 2D space. It's different than the reality that we have today. And in, extended reality is more of an umbrella term that we use to encompass the three types of reality. And the first one is augmented reality, and that's a little bit more on the low immersion side. We can do this in 2D space. You do this with your computers, you do this with your phones. If you try to purchase something from the IKEA app, you can put the couch in your home. If you play Pokemon Go, that's all augmented reality. So it's using some sort of computer generated device, uh, device to project something generated into the real world view. Mixed reality uh, is a little bit higher immersion than augmented reality. Usually mixed reality requires some sort of headset to complete so that you have a real world view and you also have a view of overlying pieces that are um, virtual. So it's, a, it's sort of a mixed view. The highest level of immersion is virtual reality, which is what I'm gonna focus mostly on today is the VR piece. And that's when you're in a headset, completely immersed, the real world goes away and you're in this sort of virtual space above you, below you, all around you, you see nothing, you hear only what you hear in the virtual world. To give you a little bit of background, uh, AR and VR is still relatively new and it is growing sphere. So if you look at this graph, uh, this space here in 2023, sorry, this, this corner is probably not gonna work on the screen, but here in 2023, as of, I think this data was the first uh, quarter of the year, in 2023, it was estimated that we will have 97.7 million uh, users in virtual reality and about 23 million users in augmented reality. And if you look at, this, at that, the growth of this since 2020, it's set to grow exponentially. And we hope to see this growth because the more we see the growth, that's more money invested, that's more technology that's going to happen. And if you look how the metaverse is making money, the biggest sectors, and if you look here in 2022, um, in 2022, the biggest sectors were e-commerce and gaming, with health and fitness and workplace and education following that up, and then everything else looked together and other. But you can see, again, hopefully the exponential growth, and you see that it's projected that by 2030, we're going to be 10 times that amount at 490 billion U.S. dollars being invested in this technology. Well, not being invested, but being made on this technology. So it's growing. Uh, I like to think of, uh, of AR and VR as being in its infancy, and it's sort of like, where is this going to go in the next 10 years? Just like we, we thought about our cell phones, you know, 20 years ago, not everyone had a cell phone in their pockets all the time, but now we do. It's a piece of integral technology that we use every single day, and I think that just the same as that was 20 years ago, this is where VR, AR is going. It's, I think it will eventually trans continue to be a huge part of our society. Looking at uh, STEM in general, so science, technology, engineering, and math, we're looking at how extended reality is being used, and it's used mostly in the area of physics and math, maybe chemistry, astronomy, some engineering purposes, manufacturing, but for our purposes, the three biggest are healthcare, exercise, and rehabilitation. So those are the three areas where uh, extended reality can make the most impact. And if you look at some of the projected data, Healthcare and medical devices are set to be one of the biggest growing areas for the metaverse and AR and VR. So if you're thinking about a career in the medical side of the world, think about this because you're probably going to see it at some point. For our purposes today, I'm going to talk about how VR is being used for health, exercise, and for treatment purposes as well. Not just treatment, but also rehabilitation. So I, I, I like to look at meta-analyses, I like to look at review studies. So first review study that I like to show looked at the area of exergaming, which is exercise in the metaverse or exercise with virtual reality. And they compared that to traditional exercise. 
And what they're finding in this review study from 2020 was that as compared to traditional exercise, exercise in the metaverse improves overall fitness, improves muscular strength, balance, participation and rehabilitation, not just participation, but continued compliance during your rehab program. And it also decreases the fatigue perception that you have, your stress and your depression. So I like to, to grab onto that fatigue perception piece because it's really interesting to me that compared to traditional exercise, so that means going to the gym, going to your traditional rehabilitation. So when you think about rehab, if you've been, it's very traditional exercise. They give you a set of exercises, they work through them with you, and then you go home. Well, fatigue perception can be really big for traditional exercise, and it's one of the things that prevents people from doing traditional exercise. So if you make this a game, you make this fun, people don't realize they're getting activity and exercise when they really are. So that's one of the benefits of this. So I love to highlight that piece. So VR is being used for health, it's being used for exercise. Uh, another study to pull up from you in 2019, they did a meta-analysis of uh, some controlled trials. And the big piece is there in bold for you where they found a large effect size for VR intervention on physical activity levels. Meaning that using VR for exercise increased frequency and intensity of activity and exercise. So a large effect size is what we wanna see. We wanna see VR having an impact on what we're doing. So research is showing us this is working. People like it, they're using it, and they adhere to it really, really well. VR has also been used for treatment and rehabilitation. So uh, how many of you are interested in the medical field or potentially going in that direction? This is great because VR has been used in so many capacities. First and foremost for acute and chronic conditions, when we think about stroke, stroke rehabilitation is really important. When you think about an area of the body that's been affected, VR, Exercise has been shown to positively impact gait and balance, which is one of the biggest issues with stroke. Reaching tasks, ADLs, activities of daily living, reaching out, interacting with your world can be a really huge problem for individuals who have stroke, who have had a stroke. It decreases, decreases contracture in your muscles. So when you think about exercise and activity, moving the muscles, using them can sometimes help decrease muscle contracture and improves range of motion for individuals with stroke. And I have links to all the research. If at any point you would like that, let me know. I'm happy to share any research studies with you. When you think about cardiac rehabilitation post heart attack, you are going to see that VR has been used as an exercise medium to increase caloric expenditure, increase heart rate, and it increases enjoyment during the exercise and activity, and it also helps with compliance. Compliance is huge, obviously, for any treatment in the healthcare world. Compliance is one of the biggest things we think about. How can we get our patients to do what we want them to do? VR has been shown to improve that. Traumatic brain injuries, so there's, there's a lot of research on traumatic brain injury and the use of VR as a rehabilitation tool, and not just for physical things like gait and balance, but also things like cognition and attention. You can do a lot of training between the body and the mind in virtual reality. So it's one of those, one of the biggest symptoms of TBI, if anyone's ever had a concussion, is concentration and the ability to think through complex tasks while you're still having those symptoms. So VR has been shown not just to help physically, but also mentally after a TBI. Thinking of a little bit uh, more acutely, pain management. I worked at Shriners Hospital for Children in Lexington for eight years, and one of the things that our hospital implemented was a VR distraction program for children with cerebral palsy. So one of the problems with cerebral palsy is that you have contractures in the muscles. When the muscles are contracted, uh, these children will walk with what we call crouched gait, meaning that they have flexed knees and hips. So you can imagine walking around all day long with flexed hips and flexed knees. When it hurts, two, it's hard, three, you're using a ton of calories. So to make them more energy efficient, make them better with their activities of daily living, you can do things like injections of Botox, not pretty face Botox, muscle Botox, to decrease the uh, level of contracture in the muscles. But it hurts. You can imagine trying to Botox a 10-year-old with tiny muscles, but then deeply in the muscles in multiple places. So if this is not just one stick of Botox, this is multiple sticks, it does not feel well. These children do not get put to sleep. They do this in the clinic rooms. And to help combat discomfort and pain, 
virtual reality can be used to, for a distraction. And this has also been done not just with injections, but with burn treatments. And burn treatments is one of the most painful things that someone can, can uh, have to go through in a medical setting. Again, distraction. Falls in balance. VR is amazing at putting people in situations that seem to be dangerous, but are not. So if you're in a lab space and you wanna teach someone to step off the curb, yes, you can put a step there, right? And you can have them practice stepping up and down off of the step. But what if then you put the headset on, you have a program that every time they walk towards the step and they step up or down onto it, there's also people walking, there's cars going behind them, there's sounds, there's noises, it mimics the real world scenario more than just being in a laboratory or being in the rehab space. So it brings a different element to therapy, especially for falls and for balance. Because again, balancing in a lab is a lot different than balancing in the real world. And then rehabilitation in general, um, across the board, VR therapies have been shown to increase excitement and motivation, increase fidelity, which uh, means that it's more like your activities of daily living. So if you're an occupational therapist and you're thinking, how can I get my patients to, I don't know, make breakfast for themselves more appropriately. If you don't have an actual kitchen as part of your rehab setting, you can put them in virtual reality, they can use their hands and they can do reaching tasks. And it can be a little bit more, more real world like than let's say just taking a weight and lifting it up and down. Also cognitive fidelity as well. So attention to attention on multiple tasks. So virtual reality, and extended reality in general can be used for many, many purposes. And I like to show you this because it has a wide ranging sort of impact and influence. So it's gonna be up to you to decide how best to use VR and, and XR. It can be used for virtual laboratories. It can be used as a laboratory because you have no restriction on time, space, or consumables. One of the biggest problems with, with doing things over and over and over is that you lose things. Right, you lose the ability to process something once you've already processed it, perhaps. You don't have that virtual reality. You can simulate something over and over and over and never have to worry about time, space, or consumables. Hands-on training and rehabilitation. Again, repetition without consumables, the ability to increase safety while also mimicking a real-world scenario. So there's a lot of companies um, in uh, the engineering world and the manufacturing world that put their employees through hands-on training so that when they get into the, the realm of actually manufacturing a device or using equipment, they've already used that equipment a thousand times in a virtual space so that it is more effective, one, for training them, and two, for the safety because you don't want to mess up your first try in the real world when that could have potential uh, real-world consequences for injury. Exploring abstract concepts. So VR is really, really neat because it can add a layer to the real world that you can't see. I like to tell people like when you are looking in microscopes and you're looking at different molecules, everything's still flat. It's a picture, right? It's a 2D picture. And what XR can help you do is bring those flat two-dimensional pictures and visualizations of 3D 3D space, because that's what we live in, we live in 3D space, we can take that 2D model and make it a 3D model so that you can interact with these structures, these concepts, actually the way they would be in the real world. So that's one of the ways that the chemists use this, people who work with tissues, they will actually create the three-dimensional models, manipulate those, change those, and use that as a way to interact instead of doing that on a 2D space. You can also do exploration, travel, time, money. It's not an issue in virtual reality. Probably the only issue is creating the, the, the program to make that happen. But once you do it, it's like I have a, um, I'm working with a professor of um, philosophy who was talking about ancient Greek and Rome. He's like, I really wish my, I could take my students to Rome. I said, I got you because I can put you in virtual space, you can walk down the streets in Rome, you can listen to the culture happen, you can see the spaces, because people have recorded this and created these spaces. So I can promise you, no matter where you wanna go, there's probably somewhere, someone who's created something that you can look at, or if you're interested, you create your own stuff, which is really, really interesting to think about. 
And the last piece is creation of prototypes and simulations. And this is going to happen more and more, especially as we're integrating things like um, artificial intelligence into virtual reality, which is happening. So you can imagine now a virtual space with virtual data, and then you have AI over here who can manipulate that data, and it can help you predict what's going to happen. Because unfortunately right now, a lot of what we have is only built in, and, and you build sort of parameters within the program of if I do A and B, then C will happen. But what if you don't know what C is and you don't know what the outcome is? That's where AI can come in. And so if you build these prototypes, you build these simulations, you can have things like artificial intelligence help you figure out what's next. And again, it happens in 3D space and not a 2D space. So issues to consider when you're thinking about using some extended reality are gonna be things like technical glitches. This is newer technology, it's gonna glitch. I mean, even our cell phones, our computers today, they, things go wrong, right? And unfortunately with new, uh, what we call emerging technologies, this is gonna happen. You're gonna have technical glitches. Cost of devices can be huge. You can get something as simple as a Google Cardboard that you throw your phone in and you can see for like two bucks or you can even make one yourself and it's really, really cheap and you can see some virtual worlds or you can spend, I don't know, probably the $3,000 for Apple's new headset that they're coming out with and then you buy a gaming computer for another $3,000 or $6,000 for one device and one, one ability to use it. So it can range from almost free to thousands and thousands of dollars. So it just depends on what you want and how you're going to use it. Applications are sometimes not realistic. So when you think about the virtual world, it's right now we don't have the computing power to make the virtual world look like this real world. So sometimes things look a little bit more like a cartoon and they look a little bit less like the real world. But research shows us through, through different psych, uh, psychological journals, I've read several research papers that said that say, even though it looks a little less realistic, given enough time in that space, you think it's real. That's why you see people that stand on the side of a virtual building that looks like a cartoon, the building drops out from under them and they're falling, they scream and they drop to the floor because it feels real. It's how people run into walls, it's how they throw things and actually hit things. There's a lot of funny videos about people it might not be easy to use some of these applications or you may not be able to find an application that fits your specific purposes. So you either have to pay for or create something on your own, which can get expensive and time consuming. So to me, those are the two problems. Is something might not be easy to use or you may not find something exactly what you want. And it can take anywhere, uh, the, the company Unity, has anybody heard of Unity? Uh, they're one of the biggest companies where you can create 3D modeling and they have a 52 week program that you can go through for free, become a certified Unity programmer and create your own information. But that's a lot of time, a lot of effort, even though it's free training. So use that how you will. Some issues related to actually using this technology. One of the biggest is motion sickness. A lot of people get motion sick in this without the proper acclimation period. I, there's been studies that show that women get more motion sick than men, but given the time, you start five minutes, you go to six, you go to seven, you go to 10 minutes, you increase incrementally the time that you're in virtual reality, you can bypass that, that, that potential of motion sickness. So sensory processing issues, so that you have individuals that have uh, maybe a TBI, maybe sometimes with the TBI, they're not comfortable in that space, it doesn't feel well to them. Trigger warnings is huge, especially if you have not made any of the program. So you have to think about potential programming issues and content issues that might be with any of the applications. Mobility and accessibility issues are huge because right now you have to have hands to use VR. And what if you have a patient that has an amputation on one side? How is that gonna work for them? Maybe you have a patient that has that uh, is in a wheelchair, how is that gonna be accessible for them? So you have to think about those things. And the last but not least is a secure environment because when you're immersed in virtual reality, you forget the real world exists. You need to have a, a secure space in which to do this. A little bit about what the future is going to look like. First and foremost is AI. AI is huge, it's everywhere right now. I'm sure you're familiar with it. And currently AI is being plugged into all of this. So I'm really excited to see what these virtual worlds are gonna look like with, with AI and artificial intelligence 
helping power those programs because in the past they haven't been as much. And then the next one is haptics. Sorry, that video, there was a video there. It did not pop up. There it comes, slowly, slowly. Um, but this is a video that shows you haptics. And haptics means how, um, what kind of biofeedback do you get from different devices? And currently you only get biofeedback either from, sometimes with the headset itself or with the controller. So you think haptics is that your PlayStation controller vibrates when you do certain things, right? That's haptics. So what if we had hands that had gloves that then when you pick something up virtually, you get feedback that you're touching something? Or what if you're, you're exercising and every time you do something right, you get some biofeedback in a suit? I can tell you right now, Tesla has a suit called Tesla Suits, and it costs about $20,000 to get one suit, and you can get a developer package, and you can think about it, and you can try it. I have, I don't have one. I wish I did. It's $20,000, but that can range all the way down to some newer gloves that are coming out that are like three or $400. They're not perfect, but it's a way to start thinking that as I pick up the virtual cup, I get some sort of feedback in my hand that I'm touching. So that's sort of the future. And my question for you is, how are you gonna use XR? How is this gonna be part of what you do in your future? Because I promise you it's in, the future, in your future, unless it dies an ugly death in the next 10 years, which could happen. But currently it's set not to do that. So I wanna know how you're gonna use it. Does anybody, bonus points for anybody who knows where that picture came from, the fan art. It's a movie and a book. Ready Player, oh, Ready Player One. It's a book written, I think it was written in the, 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 the early 2000s. The book written in the early 2000s, Ready Player One. It's all about how, what our world would look like. It's a little dystopian about the world is now all in the metaverse. And it's a really great, it's a good movie, but the book's better. It's a great book. But I want to know how you're going to use VR. And that's what I leave you with is that question. How are you going to use extended reality? One comment and two questions, and one question. And the comment is, many people usually don't like the headsets that are too heavy, so they don't use them. And the yeah. second question is, and that's a question for research, when you look at the headset, you're always looking at a very near distance, your eyes close focus, you're just on the screen. Yeah. There's a lot of evidence that's very harmful as a long term for people. And so, what do you deal, how do you deal with that? Because eyes need to be able to focus on your eye and your eyes. Yeah, that's the thing is that you're not getting the relaxation of the eye. But if the, when you're thinking about long-term use, I'm still thinking about short sessions of 30 minutes to an hour that's or less. Long time and, and it could be for eyes. I'm not an eye expert. I know nothing about eyeballs other than we see with them. But uh, I do think that some of the research that has been shown in virtual reality is that in the short term, it does not do damage to the eye. But it can cause headaches and stress headaches because of the focusing. And, but I've seen nothing at the moment that says if you're in VR for this long, it's going to damage your eye in this way. I've not seen that. So I, but I do. To your other comments, uh, what was, what was the, the other comment was just that most most people the headset heavy. Much too heavy. Yeah, they're they're trying to fix that. They're making more balanced headsets so that as each generation comes out, they get less and less heavy in the front. So the new Quest Three is supposedly more balanced. Yeah, we'll they see. use a thing called pancake lens, so it's plastic mm -hmm. instead of glass. So apparently that's the new yeah. Thanks again for everybody for coming. I'm Dr. Bagley. Uh, I'm one of the faculty in kinesiology, and I'm also talking about VR. So the next few talks will be about that as well. Uh, my talk is Active Virtual Reality Gaming, Artificial Intelligence, and the Future of Fitness. So kind of more of a fitness centric talk. All right, so basically I want to start with my integrated view of exercise physiology. I'm an exercise physiologist. I think of bodies as systems, but all working together, right? From the whole body all the way down to the molecular level. And guess what? Now we add something plus technology, right? So all of us have a smartwatch or a phone or a computer, some type of technology that we're using probably a large percentage of our day, right? So when we think about physiology, we almost have to think about it with technology nowadays. Um, this was just an article that was about our lab maybe a year or so ago in the Wall Street Journal, but kind of talking about exercising in the metaverse, and that's where I'm gonna kind of lead you in the next few slides. Ultimately, we're always looking at improving human health and performance as well. So this could be from a sport performance background or maybe just activities of daily living. All right, so in this talk, I'm just gonna quickly cover 
First, is VR gaining in a, a valid mode of exercise? So that's kind of a question that we tried to answer in our lab. I'll try to convince you yes, but we'll see. Uh, what are the barriers keeping you, keeping this from going mainstream? And is this the future of fitness, or is it part of the future of fitness? All right, so first thing I want to talk about, I've always been interested in technology, right? I'm kind of like a technophile. This is a picture of my first grant that I wrote to my dad when I was 11 years old, and it's to get a laptop. So mid-90s, laptops weren't around, but I watched Jurassic Park, and I was like, I gotta get one of those things. That is really cool. So I wrote this grant. I, I, you can't read it here, but I say I'm responsible enough to have a laptop. I'm asking nicely. It's not like I'm trying to take your money. Like, I was pretty convincing, so guess what? I got a laptop. That was the Toshiba Satellite Pro. And I probably wouldn't be here without having that laptop when I was a kid because, you know, I wasn't really into coding and stuff, but I started learning about these things uh, and stuff like that. So success. So anyway, I've always been interested in technology. And if you want to see how we got here, you can go all the way back to around 1400 when the printing press came out. All the technology we have is not an accident. This was through science, technology. Building upon that, you'll notice it took hundreds of years to get things like the steam engine, right? light bulbs, cars. We had a moon landing, that's cool, right? So some people don't believe it. Landing happened, right, 1960s. Microprocessor, word processor, computers, cell phones, human genome, all the way up downward, gene, human gene editing. So I don't even know what the future is gonna dictate, but basically I wanna highlight a few things we're gonna talk about. A portable gas analyzer to measure oxygen consumption. That's important in our field. The VR headset actually came out a long time ago, decades ago, still here, social media, and then artificial intelligence, these things all lead to where we are right now. So some things to consider too, technology is a double-edged sword. I'm gonna give you the pros, right, all the good things, but there's also some negatives to exercise, things to consider. What about equity and accessibility? These things are super expensive. We are, we are in the richest country in the world that's ever existed, you know? That is a privilege, right? So we're very privileged to have this. What about abuse and overuse? The first speaker talked about abuse of drugs, but you can abuse technology and overuse it. I mean, look around you. I can see uh, everybody on their phone and computer all the time, right? It's almost a necessity, but it can be overdone. What about future ramifications? We don't know where this is gonna lead. Kids have been using you know, social media for a decade now. I don't know if it's going so well, right? So we gotta think about these negatives. If you're interested in this, check out my colleague, Dr. Andy Galford's book for more thoughts it's called Unplugged. It's kind of ahead of its time. It came out you know, pre-COVID, and I think it's held pretty true for the last decade or so. All right, so has anybody ever used VR or AR in here? I think we have, we have a few people. Yeah, so you're kind of familiar, and if you haven't, it's changing so rapidly. So I wanna say, this is three generations ago. It looks old to me now. This looks like one of the big brick cell phones to me now because it, the newest uh, Quest is coming out called the MetaQuest 3. It's about $500. It's got these pancake lenses. It's going to be really light. And the pass-through, the augmented reality, is supposed to be really, really good. I know some people have used it. I'm not going to mention names kind of in here. But I want to also kind of talk about this VR Health Institute. Um, so this is something that we got started about 2017. So the first time I started, I picked up a, a VR headset was in 2017. We were approached by a guy named Aaron Stanton, who's a developer, he was at Apple at the time, and he came up to us and said, I think that this is exercise. I'm like playing games in here, I think I'm exercising. And I was like, yeah, right, you're just playing a video game. This is not exercise, your heart rate's going up, it's a sympathetic nervous system response. You know, I was like getting all like physiological. And then I played it, and I, I kind of changed my tune a little bit. So that's where I'm gonna go through the next few slides. Is this really exercise? So the way we measured it, this, this room might look familiar to you, but a little different. This is room 111, just down the way before it was redone. This is Ilse Gomez, one of our researchers, back in, in the first time we actually put a headset on, we started measuring gas exchange, so measuring oxygen consumption. Just to go back in time, 1850s people were starting to do this, so this has been around for a little while as well, speaking of technology. And what about portable gas analyzers? So this is kind of, like I don't know, bagpipe slash hookah looking device. It was one of the earliest portable gas analyzers and they could actually measure oxygen consumption. And then over the last about 120 years, people have been getting better and better at this. The goal here is to measure, again, how much oxygen you're using so we can calculate how many calories you're using at the time, calorie burn, right, and measure your metabolism. All right, so we have a long history of this. This was the first time we kind of got this going in the lab as well. One of the first times uh, we were on TV, but this is one of our students playing this game. So we have a little area set up. 
This system, again, it's a little old. This is HTC Vive, a little dated, but still it was serving its purpose at the time. So this first study we did, again, was done by Dulce Gomez. I got a shout out to her. She's a, a postdoc now at Harvard. You've heard of Harvard, right? Probably one of the best universities in the world, right? So she's a postdoc there, but this was her first paper, Metabolic Goth, Cost and Exercise Intensity During Active VR Gaming. So what we did was we got over 30 people to play some games. First, we had them rest. We measured oxygen consumption with that max. Here's rest. A little under 5 ml per kg per minute, 3.5. We're going by this. And we had them play a rhythm game. Significantly more calorie use, significantly more oxygen use. We had to play an archery game, even more oxygen used during that game. You'll notice in the corner, this probably looks like those ESPR ratings, the T for teen, D for everyone. We started doing it calorie pumping, calories per minute. So this is similar to swimming. And then finally we got to a boxing game. So this used the most energy that we've seen during gameplay, sprinting 15 plus calories a minute. You'd be hard pressed to get a workout where you're exercising 15 calories a minute, right? So what did we find? Looks like exercise, right? I thought the heart rate response was from something else, but sure enough, people were definitely exercising in VR. Now, a really interesting thing I want to point out too is that they weren't just exercising, they were having a little bit different um, kind of psychological variables that we see too. So we quantify these by the ACSM guidelines. We had light, moderate, vigorous exercise on these three games. We would imagine when these people were on the treadmill that they would say that they were going light, moderate, and vigorous. Uh, you know, if you're going by this RPE scale or perceived exertion, but what we actually found when we asked them is they were they thought they were exercising at light, light, and moderate activities. So this, you know, kind of tracked across a couple different studies we did. This was another study of follow-up by Trenton Stewart, and he reported that RPE was consistently lower than estimated RPE at any game that we played across all levels. Novice, expert, didn't matter if they're in the lab or not. So it seems like this is at least pretty consistent among players, which is a good thing. Like maybe you'll be playing these games and not know that you're exercising, right? So that's kind of like what our thought process was there. So is it a valid form of exercise? Yeah, probably is, right? So it depends on how you do it, how you use it, right? But we think it can be a valid form of exercise. So what about the future of fitness? So there's current barriers, right, for this. We kind of mentioned some, and Dr. Wallace mentioned some as well. Gaming culture. Gaming culture is a pretty sedentary culture. If anybody's on Discord and stuff, people probably aren't, you know, also doing marathons and gaming. Now, maybe there are some people for sure, but it's not common. So we try to gamify fitness and maybe try to build this into some fitness programs of people that haven't exercised before. Accessibility, like I mentioned, cost is really relatively expensive. The new MetaQuest 3 can be about 500 bucks getting down there, but if you're looking at the new Apple device, it's So there's cost right there. And then engineering, hardware and software issues. Um, we've had some talks about motion sickness. From what I've heard, the MetaQuest 3, that issue might be resolved. So depending, it could have been a lot about refrain rate, stuff like that. Um, fitness tracking with AI, which I'll talk about in a second. Fitness tracking is getting really good. If you have a watch right now, it's exponentially better than if you had a Fitbit in you know, 2010 or 11, right? So the fitness tracking is getting better. And then designing new modes of VR and AR. Uh, and I'm using these terms loosely, VR, AR, extended reality, all of it's really gonna be the same thing. Like VR might be an old term in the next 10 years too. So what about the future of this, right? We've got endless opportunities to gamify fitness. That's the cool thing about this is once you have the hardware, it's relatively easy to make the software. Developers can do it pretty quick. Um, they're building platforms to build it yourself as well too, so that's the kind of stuff coming out. There's always new modes of VR and AR. In our lab, we've used some exercise bikes that are attached to VR and AR, so we're using new things like that. And then this is where the AI comes in with exercise, responsive exercise. Does anybody know what responsive exercise might mean? Let's say I'm exercising and I'm trying to train for um, you know, a marathon or something. Is it gonna start, am I gonna start like running 100 or let's say running 20 miles my first week? Probably not, right? I'm gonna start out at a lower amount. I'm gonna go up, as I start getting more fit, I should be extending the amount of exercise I can do. What responsive exercise might do for you is actually do this for you. So think about a coach that's always there in your ear telling you, you can do it, you can do it, but also telling you when to back off. Because it's not, you're not gonna linearly get better. You're gonna have to periodize this, right? So when we think about this, AI is really already here. Artificial intelligence is all around us. It's being incorporated into every major 
program, your Google Calendar has AI, your you know, Microsoft Office has AI, all that stuff is being built in. And what that is, it's just a smarter way to do things, really. These uh, experiences are getting built into games. I'm gonna show you a, a, kind of an example of that in a second. And then this is only getting better, right? So this is something that every, I used to say every year, but now it's like every week or every month something's coming up. Um, one thing I will mention is if anybody watches or listens to podcasts, if you heard of Lex Friedman podcast, check it out because last week or two weeks ago, he did an interview with uh, Mark Zuckerberg, right? And they were using the MetaQuest 3 and they were doing like basically the entire interview in the metaverse across you know the country. And it, it's insane, it looks so real and it's all done in the metaverse. So check that out if you're interested. So like I said, this is only getting better. One example of this is like, if we're tracking our fitness inside an app, this is, this is the, the beta version, it's still in development, but we have this through the VR Health Network. You can download it. I think it only works on Android now. Don't quote me on that. We're trying to get it working on Apple. But it's basically a fitness tracker that uses heart rate to measure what heart rate you're in. Let's say you're playing Thrill of the Fight or Beat Saber or something. Where's your heart rate at? And you'll be able to tell it. I'd like to exercise more and get more fit. The idea is that this heart rate response, if your heart rate's too low, it'll make the game a little harder. If the heart rate's too easy or too high, it'll make the game a little easier, right? So this is where that responsive exercise and AI comes into play on a very simple scale. So basically the goal of this, you know, is this the future of fitness? I think it's probably part of it. Companies are putting billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, probably upwards of trillions of dollars into this technology. I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, our goal really is to help develop though, effective, sustainable, and more accessible ways to do this. So that's kind of where you all come in. If you're interested in this, and you're in your 20s or 30s or even 40s, you've got a lot of time to work on these kinds of questions and these kinds of problems. So I do want to acknowledge all the students and collaborators that have helped work on this stuff over the years. We still have stuff going on. If you're interested in working with us, let me know. Um, these are some of our industry partners we work with and some of our funding as well. All right, thank you all. I have one question. Yes. Just always curious about it. Um, and then I know that the, the obvious questions were asked like for example, when we see my children in development, it's very important that they have the movement of their eyes, right? Um, in an unlinear format. So what happens when the kids are exposed for too long and uh, you know, when they have only this linear development, you know, like looking the screen yeah. more time than it, it is. So I think that's the cool thing about this new technology. It's not linear and you're not looking at something right here. When you're focusing, it's like I'm focusing across there. So I'm looking far away, even though these are right in front of my eyes. And the field of view is now 180 degrees. So it's just, you can look side to side and they all have eye tracking. So it knows exactly where you're looking. So your avatar in, in the metaverse or whatever can look directly at you and you can see that as well. So I think the what would be bad is if kids are sitting right in front of the TV and looking linearly and playing like that and not moving. This might actually make it better, like better for kids, right? Because they're able to actually move and think and look far away. So I think that's the pro. I think that it might be, well, it is really better than just looking at a TV screen and it's getting better and better to where it's gonna be the point where you have your glasses and it's no different than looking through your glasses. That's a good point though, yeah. I'm worried about kids too because they're the ones that are gonna be using this even though they're not necessarily supposed to. A lot of these are for, I think um, Dr. Flynn will probably talk about this with kids, but um, yeah, they're made for they're made for adults really. If kids are using it. I'm a developmental psychologist. I specifically am a cognitive developmental psychologist, and I focus on children's use of media and technology, mm -hmm. uh, how it impacts cognition and learning, as well as health. And so today, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background to kind of ground. Um, everyone in my areas of research. I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about some of my prior work, which is really focused, focused on active video games, not in virtual reality. Things like Dance Dance Revolution, way back, um, We Fit, and then going into some of my current research on VR, which is in collaboration with Dr. Bagley and um, Kent Lorenz in kinesiology. So, first to start, 
An area of cognition that I'm interested in is called executive functioning. Executive functioning is a cluster of skills that includes attention, inhibition, cognitive flexibility. These things aid with problem solving, decision making, self-regulation, emotional control. And when, with children, what we know is that deficits in these areas result in poor academic success. Um, poor behavior, poor social skills. And we also know that children who live in poverty, who have a lot of toxic stress in their lives, who have developmental disabilities or learning disorders, tend to have lower executive functioning as well. But the good news is that research shows that children with the biggest deficits can improve um, through certain everyday experiences or interventions. And the other thing about executive functioning that's really cool compared to other areas of cognition is it has a long developmental trajectory. So what I mean by that is it's not an area of cognition that's fully formed by like five or six. It keeps developing all the way to 25. So there's lots of ways to intervene and make change when it comes to executive functioning. So there's been a body of work looking at what kinds of experiences improve executive functioning. And the ones I've been the most interested in are first video games. So when you think about a lot of video games, they are in a fast paced environment. They require decision making in real time. They can be, have multiple different demands that include mental manipulations, what's going on on the screen, with physical manipulations, what's going on with your controller. And so you also have to often coordinate perspectives between people. Kids love them, they're really fun. We know that these games are impacting cognition in certain ways. The other area, which kind of um, definitely relates, and I think and Caesar touched on this earlier, is that exercise interventions also improve cognition, specifically executive functioning in both the short and long term for both adults and children. This body of research really shows that aerobic exercise has a much bigger area or impact on this area of cognition compared to like running or biking something um, that doesn't require as, um, as much complex movement or the cognitive engagement. So active video games came along, I don't even know when, um, got the Wii Fit, um, Wii Active, some of those platforms. Um, and people, kids love playing video games. They're early adopters. They loved these games when they came out. So researchers, um, including myself, kind of jumped on board and said, are those types of games like exercise? Yes, we found that they were. Um, they, the ones that use the whole body had the most impact. So full body games versus like a tennis or a baseball. Kids, through intervention, um, people found that they could reduce body fat, fat increase their um, energy exertion in long term, um, and also their self-efficacy for exercise. And these were really motivating and engaging. So, so that, was, that was great on that front. Um, but when I, as a, someone who studies executive functioning, what I was really interested in is thinking like, okay, we know video games make a change, we know exercise makes a change, and so, but what's this mechanism? So when we think about the brain and cognition, there's a couple different things that can create change. Cognitive engagement, just doing something, um, music would be another example, that's cognitively engaging and stimulating. Um, or is it more like physical exertion? Is it the, the physiological response, which I'm sure most of you in this room know way more about than I do. But is it that aspect? And so looking at active video games, some people started saying, well, maybe if we use active video games as a way to break this down, because active video games have both this cognitive engagement of video games and also the physically active aspect. And so my body of research um, has really fo focused in on that, breaking down that mechanism of change. I've done a series of uh, four different settings with hundreds of children um, over the years, all in the age of six to 12 years old. I've used summer camp settings and labs really looking at these types of active video games, um, both as a form of physical activity, but also trying to figure out this mechanism of change of how do these active video games impact executive functioning, and is there, um, is it this cognitive engagement or physical activity? So 
generally, I use experiments even when I'm in naturalistic settings. So what that means is I give kids a battery of pre-tests, things like physical fitness, um, cognitive tests, media experiences. They participate in an active video game session. Um, some of those, these studies have been acute studies. I don't have time to go into them all, but if you have questions, happy to answer them. Some of the studies have been for like 30 minutes of exercise. Some of them have been 45 minutes of exercise over time, um, every weekly. I use a whole bunch of different platforms and games um, and compared different conditions. So I've compared active video games to exercise, regular video games, control, all those had control conditions. I've had kids play together, I've had them play alone. And then at the end of the study, I do a post-test battery to see about change. So in general, just some summary of my overall findings in this space. Like other researchers, I found kids do increase their fitness and their attention to ex uh, their attention to exercise, um, their, their self-efficacy around this, they feel like they have social support. I had a lot of kids, um, I did a whole bunch of studies with kids with developmental disabilities, specifically autistic children, and they always would say, I really hate exercise, but I'm a gamer, I love doing this, um, kind of going back to Dr. Bagley, Bagley's point earlier. And then the main finding that um, my work has really contributed it is this idea that the, um, oh wait, I'm still on exercise, sorry. Um, is, uh, so then also in the different conditions, exercise definitely has the biggest energy exertion compared to active video games or regular video games or control groups. But things change when we think about cognition. So when I started looking at the changes in executive functioning, it really was the combination of the cognitive engagement and the physical activity that shows the biggest change in executive functioning across the board for all children. Um, other things, the more they play, the bigger change in executive functioning. Um, things like engagement matter. Kids who are highly achieving or also very frustrated, which represents that they're being challenged, have big increases to executive functioning as opposed to kids who report that they're very bored, which is kind of a measure of like disengagement. So it's not just being in the game environment, playing the game, you have to be active and engaged in it. So the biggest improvements for kids who had the lowest scores, um, I have a really diverse samples with some of my kids and some of them are, are way under um, uh, norms for their ages, but they, they, can, they see these improvements even in the short term. Um, all kids really love to play, so like, you know, I always kind of joke is, you know, sometimes is that part of influencing the change? Is it just that kids are having fun and they're cognitively engaged um, while playing? Um, and they enjoy all, you know, all aspects of these studies. So this work has, you know, as technologies have changed, I've also started thinking about what is this, um, what does virtual reality mean for kids? And what does it mean um, in certain spaces? There's really limited research out there because a lot of the commercially based systems aren't, aren't um, ready for kids' consumption, though they're playing them. Um, there is research on clinical populations that really show that it's feasible and safe, it's enjoyable and calming. I did a big study um, at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago with, in the pediatric intensive care unit. We used Google virtual reality glasses. Kids loved it, it helped reduce pain, it kept them calm, they, it distracted them. Um, it was very feasible to do, we had a great time doing that study. There's also research on educational engagement and showing what that looks like for kids. Most of this work is on researcher design games, which has a lot, which is great, but also has some real world problems. It, most kids aren't using researcher design games for specific purposes. They're using whatever's available in the app store on the device that they have at home. And that's really where we're lacking um, any research. And so in the collaborations here at San Francisco State, the things I'm really interested in is, first of all, does this immersive nature of VR lead to bigger cognitive changes? So just because it is more immersive, it is more real world, can we see these changes? Do children exert those that same level of energy expenditure as exercise? So do we see the same results in kids that, um, that others are finding with adults as we just heard from Dr. Bagley? And then is there, is there a level of intensity? So um, in VR, some, a lot of the games involve movement, and a lot of them 
involve bigger movement. So with kids, do we see that, um, that difference when they're playing? But first, before we can get to any of those really cool questions, we really have to know, like, we know kids are playing them at home, um, but can they actually play these commercially games at all? What challenges do they have? Um, can they exert, you know, can they even exert um, energy in these? And so, and we, you know, we also heard about some of the potential challenges, the ease of use, the sensory issues. Kids have smaller hands. Um, it's actually um, a point that a lot of these systems aren't taking into account yet. So currently, here at San Francisco State, working on virtual reality, some, a series of pilot studies. So the first one finished this summer. Um, we had 40 children, first in, at a y, local YMCA, and also here at San Francisco State Skater Camp, looking at working with kids eight to 12 years old. Um, we find out what kind of media exposure have they had in the past. We find that a handful of them have played virtual reality before. Um, and then we show them a series of 20 videos of virtual reality games. These are all E for Everyone games. Um, there's actually almost like 200 E for Everyone games um, in the Oculus Quest system. And we've, we've narrowed it down to 20 that um, have, have the lowest level of motion sick, the lowest, so we don't have anything that's like a roller coaster or a flying game these, because those have higher levels and we just, we haven't wanted to mess with that, that aspect. They're all games, so there, there are, um, there's, we had found some like interesting videos that you're very immersed in that are E for everyone. We're trying to keep kids in a more interactive environment, something that's gonna have them moving, even if it's just their arms. So we show them those 20 videos, we get their feedback, what you like, what you not like, why, um, and then we have them rate those 20 videos based on uh, what they would like to play that day. So we get about five, we get their top five choices because we found that sometimes the top three don't work. Um, and then we put them in a heart rate monitor and we have them play three virtual reality games for 10 to 15 minutes. Again, as mentioned before, that's kind of like this optimal time where we know that um, it reduces motion sickness, sensory issues, any kind of uh, problems. As a side note, we've had zero um, a kind of health-related dizziness, headaches, any of that kind of stuff. We give them a break in between where we get their feedback about their experience. We use um, a exercise-induced feeling inventory to get kind of that, that um, you know, it's kind of like rate of perceived uh, exertion. Um, and then we also, during this whole time, we're video uh, recording their motions as well as screen capturing the videos. We have not analyzed any of this data yet, but we've got some like preliminary stuff that we've been doing to get ready for our next study. And what we know just from, you know, I, I work with most of the, a lot of these participants is there's a lot of variations in what kids want to play and what they report enjoying. The most popular hands down is Fruit Ninja. All of them, um, I think almost all the kids have wanted to play Fruit Ninja. There's, there's rarely a kid who Fruit Ninja doesn't make um, uh, the cut for their play. Um, a lot of interest in Beat Saber and Gorilla Tag, which is kind of like a, it's like an interactive tag game. Um, uh, pro note, you gotta turn the chat off so you don't hear um, a bunch of kids, little kids swearing at each other. Um, <laughs> learned that really, the first time we went in there, like just as adults, we're like, whoa, what's happening here? Um, sports Scramble, which is where um, you play, um, it's bowling, tennis, or baseball with different items. Um, and then they also, those are all the kind of act, more active games. And then there's also a bunch of puzzle games that they really, really um, say that they like and want to play. Something where you build um, cities, little cities, National Geographic, which is a kayaking and ice climbing, um, kind of through the Arctic game. And then Cubism, it doesn't look like I got my picture up there for that. Um, it's kind of a Tetris, um, uh, you move shapes into spaces. Um, we also, in our preliminary find, like just anecdotal findings of what I should have put on there, is we really know that there's variations in the way that children are playing. Um, there's variation in how good they do in different games, which you know, guess you know, also as we watch the heart rate monitor, there's variations in energy expenditure. Kids all love the experience. I I put some pictures here of some of our participants. What you can see is like we've had kids who've had to sit down, whose hands were too small for the controllers, and had to do some games in hand trapping. So that's, that's, they can play, they enjoyed it, that's what we got. We also have a lot of kids who kind of stand really still and they do this, right? Like there's like a lot of arm movements. And then in this bottom, um, you can see this young lady, she was jumping and kicking and 
crouching and spinning and leaping. Like, it was amazing. I, I couldn't figure out how to put a video of her up here. Um, I would have. But, um, you know, there's definitely some potential there to think about some of these variations. So with the next study, um, uh, another kind of pilot study, we're going to start looking at some individual differences. So what I mean by that is, like, what are the differences between children that might impact their virtual reality play? Um, their cognition, their baseline fitness, their experience with video games, their, um, their exercise experience and, and their gender. So we're gonna measure all of that at pre-test. We're gonna have them play three games. We're gonna pick, we're picking the three games that, that kids really seem to like that have a little bit of motion. Even that National Geographic, you kayak, you climb, you're not gonna get your heart rate way up, but we've seen, we've seen a couple kids who, who, who surprisingly did. Um, so they'll do that, that kind of as a prescribed um, with breaks in between. And then, you know, we're going to get feedback um, and do the executive functioning task again, just because we do know that acute change can happen. Um, so, you know, this is stuff that your people are interested in. I know people are interested in. I'm always looking for, for help on these projects, collaborators, research assistants, all of that. I um, uh, also want to acknowledge all of the research assistants that are currently working on this contributed, um, including some um, couple um, kinesiology master students and undergraduate students, you know, and um, also the CAD students, and then um, Dr. Bagley and Lorenz um, here, and um, the Gator Camp for sure, and some of the funding from San Francisco State. Um, this is my contact information. I'm really bad at Instagram. I'm working on it, but I put it up there. Um, and um, if, I guess I probably have time for one, maybe one question. that looked at how kids played active video games together versus how they did in the active space and versus how they played um, by themselves. Um, in terms of um, exertion, they um, exerted more energy while playing together. This was just just dance, so it's a dance motion-based game. Um, we didn't, I didn't see as big of a change in cognition as I did when they played alone. Um, and the reason I think that is, is because it was just a one-time study. And when you're attending to someone else, um, you're attending, that's literally what you're doing. You're paying attention to what the other person is doing. You're anticipating that. That reduces your own engagement and your own um, motion in those ways. You know, you're not, you're not doing as much when you're also attending to someone else. What I anticipate is over time, if a child plays those kinds of games together, um, that they would have a bigger increase overall because that attention to other actually does could in, increase executive functioning. Um, it's just in a one time, they're too. It's it's too much. It's like it's uh, it's tapping out of cognitive capacities. Um, and I've seen that in some like non-active video game play social studies. Social skills. Social skills? Yeah. Um, so I have one study that it's not active at all. It's using it's with young children using tablets and socially. Um, and what we find with that is that in um, when it comes to kids playing digital games in social groups, they um, use a lot of the, all the same social skills that they use in non-digital play. So there's a lot of um, encouragement. There's a lot of asking for help. There's a lot of what are you doing. So we've coded like um, child talk in um, while playing digital games together versus like playing traditional. Um, it looks the same. Kids are kids are playing kids are playing with the, playing in the same ways whether they're in a digital environment or a non-digital environment. I'm not saying that that's that's the greatest <laughs> news, but but that's 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 how they're adapting. They're they're you know they're kids. They play. So thank you so much for having me in here today. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, today I'll talk a little bit about getting motivated to learn, some effects on brain and behavior. So I will just start by talking a little bit about the technology that I've been using to study this topic. Um, 
It's not a very common one yet in this area of research in kinesiology, but it's getting there. Um, so electroencephalography. To establish this technology, people were thinking about how neurons communicate. And we all know it's through electric, electric impulses. So we were thinking about, well, what if we are able to measure these electrical impulses that comes from the brain? We should be able to talk a lot about what the processes are going on while we are performing a task. So that's EEG. So EEG is basically a non-invasive, direct, and continuous measure of the changes in electricity that is produced by neural activity in real time. We say that it's non-invasive because we are not getting to the brain itself. <laughs> we want the person to be healthy, alive, and um, performing tasks while we measure this. So what we do is that we give them a cap with a lot of electrodes, as you can see here. This electrode, uh, these electrodes conduct electricity really well. Um, if we touch our heads, we don't feel that electricity, but there's a lot of things coming through uh, our scalp. And the electrodes are able to capture that with the help of a gel that we put in between the electrode and the scalp. It has electrolytes, so it kind of conducts that electricity that comes from the brain uh, through the electrodes. Then we have this little equipment here that we call the amplifier, and it does exactly what it says. Uh, so it amplifies that signal so that we can really see that signal and measure that signal, uh, that electricity that is coming from the brain. So once we turn that EG on, that's what we have. So all of these lines, each of these lines represent one of the electrodes and the change in electricity that is coming through uh, each of these electrodes. You can see that it's continuous. So as long as we have that cap on, we are able to get more and more data uh, coming in real time for us. We say that this is a direct measure of brain activity because we're measuring basically the product of that brain activity, which is the change in electricity from the brain, which is different from other neuroscientific equipments like the fMRI, for instance. With fMRI, we're looking at how uh, blood oxygenation changes in certain areas of the brain, and that's it, that can indicate that the, that area is being used in performing some brain activities, but that's not always the case. It's a more indirect measure of the, that brain activity, while here we are looking at the product of that activity, so it's really a direct measure of that. EEG is not really great, though, for spatial resolution, because we're not assessing that electricity from the brain, it's coming through the skull, once it happens, uh, it gets really spread out. So we don't really know exactly which area of the brain is producing that activity, but we know we have a very good temporal resolution. So it means that the moment that brain activity happens or changes, we are able to capture that with no delay. With our area of research, uh, it's a really good tool as well because it allows us to perform some bigger movements, right? In fMRI machines, PET scan, um, they are really tight machines. We cannot move uh, a lot or at all sometimes. And here, we still need to take care about what type of movement we have, but it gives us more flexibility and allows us to perform more movements while we look at these brain activities. So what can we talk about with EG? So I told you that each of these lines, they represent the activity from one of these electrodes. We can look at this activity and look at how the brain is oscillating, uh, so with each frequency. And that's because every brain process that happens usually has a specific type of frequency in which that oscillation happens. The brain produces different frequencies all the time. So, we can look at, for instance, whether we have a very fast oscillation. If we have that very fast oscillation, we are talking about the gamma waves. And when we have that, we have a good idea that the brain is re really concentrated and is occupied with problem solving, for instance. As opposed to when we have a very slow one that we call the delta wave, 
that one happens usually when we are a slave in training. So by looking at which type of frequency we have and which ones are more powerful at a certain task, we can talk a lot about which brain process is happening while we perform that task. We can also look at how that activity changes over time. So when we do that, usually we have an event that happens and we mark the time in which that event happens. We have that information in our EG data. From there, we look forward in time and look at how that activity changes after that event. And by looking at that, we can have a good idea about how the brain's processing and interpreting that event that happened. So when we have that, we have what we call the event-related potentials, or ERPs. So here we can see time zero represents that moment when that event that we have happened. And then we can see all of those ups and downs that happened we call it the potential, so the negative ones and the positive ones. Each of those talk different things about different ways the brain interprets that event. So when we are looking at ERPs, we're mostly looking at the amplitude of these ups and downs. I'm gonna show you one specific ERP that I use a lot for my research, and that um, can give you a better idea of how we can use this type of uh, data. So one of them is called the reward positivity, or RUPI. The reward positivity, again, is an ERP. So it means that, in this case, the event that happens at time zero is some sort of feedback presentation. So in my studies, for instance, I present people feedback about the outcome of their movements. So once we have that, we have the RUPI happening here from 230 to 350 milliseconds after that feedback was presented to them. The root is that positive deflection that happens and is really related to reward processing. So if we have a rewarding feedback, a positive one, a good one, we tend to have a very large root. As opposed to when we have a not rewarding feedback, um, a negative one, I made a big mistake, big error, then I don't see a lot of root. I see that positive deflection is much smaller. So it can give us a lot of ideas about what's going on and how the brain is interpreting that feedback and using that feedback to learn, for instance. And that's because the more rewarding feedbacks we have, the more we tend to consolidate that movement that generated that positive feedback. So that's one way that I use that. I use that to investigate the effects of motivation on learning. Motivation we are all talking about motivation here today for different reasons. And we know that it's really interesting, really important for all sorts of reasons. And based on our own experiences in life, we have that good idea that motivation is really important for learning. However, we still don't have a lot of research to back this up. That's because we're mostly not measuring motivation good enough or as often as we wish we would. So I started to think about that and I started to try to decrease that gap. We have some um, theory that claims that when we have motivating practice conditions, we should have better learning. One of these types of motivating practice conditions would be those that enhance the learner's expectancies to perform well. So if the learner thinks that they are performing well in that task, they should get more motivated we as humans, we really like to perform things that we are good at, and then we should have better learning. One way that I found to try to manipulate uh, practice in that way is to give people different criteria of success to try to change the way they perceive the difficulty of the task without really changing the difficulty itself. So what I done in the past was that I had participants perform a mini shuffleboard task. So here they had to slide a little puck in that table, like that, and here their goal was to make the puck stop in that red dot in the center of the grid. So the closer to the dot, the better. They all had that same goal, okay? So here I was recording EG, and I wanted to look at that movie. So to do that, I included the participant's vision so they could not see their outcome right away. And that's because I wanted to present outcome on a computer screen 
such that I had the exact moment when that feedback appeared and they saw that feedback. So that I could get that ERP that we call. So for half of the participants, although they all had the same goal, we gave them a large zone of success. So in that case, we gave them that large area surrounding the target, and we told them that whenever the pub stops within that area, they could consider the trial a good trial. It's an arbitrary criterion that I used, and that I gave them. For the other half of the participants, they also had the zone of success, but that was much smaller. So for them, it was much harder to achieve that zone of success, therefore they tended to consider that task to be more difficult. It's a subjective perception of task difficulty. Here we can see an outcome that for this small zone group would be considered unsuccessful, not a good one, but for the large zone group would be considered successful. The same error, which represents a very objective measure of success, would be subjectively interpreted in different ways by these groups. So that's what I wanted. What I saw was that the participants with the large zone, they tended to report higher interest and enjoyment in that task after practice, meaning that they were more motivated to perform that task than the participants who considered the task to be more difficult. So we were able to manipulate their level of motivation. But what's really interesting is that we were able to manipulate the movie that they produced as well, based on that very arbitrary criteria of success that we defined. So whenever the pub stopped within their own criteria of success, their zone of success, they had larger movies than when that trial was considered unsuccessful by them, based on their zone of success. So that's really nice. We also saw that that mattered more, that subjective perception of success mattered more than the objective one. So for the same error, which is a very objective measure of success, the participants had different rupees based on their criteria of success. So for instance, if I have a very small error, very good performance, we saw that the participants with the small zone they had higher rupees than the participants with the large zone, meaning that they considered that trial to be even more rewarding than the participants with the large zone that had good trials very often. But for more bigger errors, larger errors, the participants with the large zone considered those trials to still be somewhat successful and rewarding as opposed to the participants with the, large, the small zone who had very small rupees. So here we can see that a simple task instruction that we provide to the participant that is really arbitrary can affect their motivation levels as well as the way that the brain processes feedback in a certain task, which is a great news for instructors, physical therapists, uh, coaches, physical education teachers. We have the power to manipulate all of that with a simple task instruction manipulating the subjective perception of success can affect all of that. So just really briefly, I will show you another way that we can use that same measure to answer a very different question. So this is another line of research that I studied. So first I showed you how we can use that in the motor learning area. But now I'm gonna show you how you can use that same measure, that same equipment, in uh, the exercise psychology area. So here, we were mostly interested in understanding whether the brain considers sedentary behavior to be more rewarding than physical activity. And that's because, this, if that's the case, that could explain why it's so hard for us to leave the couch and go perform some physical activity, even though we know that physical activity is really good for us, should be rewarding because it gives us a lot of good outcomes in the long term. But it's still really hard for us to do that. So what we try to do is that we have a very simple task. The participants had to press uh, two buttons. And kind of randomly for them, they were shown whether they got some rewards, so some points, or not. In some cases, when they got the rewards, they had to kind of perform 
physical activity to get this reward. So they had to squat four times before getting the reward. In other cases in which they also got the reward, they were able to get this reward while they were sitting. So here we wanted to understand whether the fact that they had to exert some energy, spend some energy to get this reward, would make the reward feel less rewarding for them. So we used the rupee as well. Here, in this experiment, we did see that, as you can see here, uh, when we had a reward, we got reward, we had higher rupees than when we did not get any reward. In this case, we did not find any evidence that sitting is more rewarding than getting the same reward while we performed a physical activity. There are so many factors that could explain these results and that could lead to different results. So for instance, here we just used uh, college students, so really young people. We didn't look at the effect of that in the long term. That could change, right? With trial, the more they get tired, that could change. But I'm just showing you uh, that the same measure, the same equipment, can be used to answer many different research questions and that can give us a lot of insight about what's going on in the brain and the behavior. So here the behavior changed because the participants tended to press the button that let them stay seated more than squatting. So the behavior changed, but we could not see the same pattern of results in the brain. So we need to investigate more what is leading to that behavior. So I am open to all of the questions that you have and Jamie wants to take over. <laughs> Uh, so we did have a question for Dr. Wallace. Uh, we noticed that you said the uh, you're immersed into the uh, certain uh, virtual or extended reality. So do you think that would be more beneficial for the introverted uh, individual that doesn't like to go outside and exercise? Or, or is there like a... Anecdotally, yes, I think so. Because I think, uh, there, I know there have been studies on this in the 2D world of, of being more free and more yourself online than maybe in person and it changes the way you interact with individuals and there have been a few studies done on avatars in virtual reality and the more the avatar let's say we all had to choose from a you know a set of generic avatars and if they were all generic they found that people were actually more likely to interact more freely than if you made the avatar look like yourself 
Mm. And so I think that does mimic the real world a lot where maybe in person we're a little more reserved for a moment than when you're online you feel that freedom to make a comment or to do something, especially if, it, if it's a little less you. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes. But then there's also research that says the more the avatars look like you, look better for yourself, the more you feel like it is you. So there's this whole embodiment issue of when I feel more embodied, I look like more of myself, but we're seeing the same trends of how I interact with other people is very similar to how you interact in, let's say, 2D virtual worlds. So I think it, it does matter. I think we're gonna see it change as, as the avatar look more like ourselves and we have more variety of how we can look, um, which I know is coming with the Quest 3 and in terms of avatar creation. So I think, I think yes, it does matter. Cool. Fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> my question is for Dr. Wallace also. Um, one thing that stood out was the use of VR for the uh, traumatic brain injuries with football players having problems like in CTE. Is there any big push for using that for like therapy for them? That's a great question. And, and right now, unfortunately for therapy purposes, it's all controlled in laboratory settings. So there's not like a, a set protocol that makes sense so there's not like a good therapy protocol that says for VR treatment you do this so we have that in the in the physical therapy world right you have pri you have tr proven therapies that say if you do this this will happen right in their research and they're, they're backed up uh, we don't have that for VR right now because it's still so new but I do think it's coming because there have been uh, I, I do know of some research with football players that don't have TBIs that get better at their game and their, their cognitive abilities in the game and decision making. So you put someone in a virtual scenario that if I'm this player and I do this, theoretically what would happen if all the other players did Y? If I do X, they do Y, what happens? And you get that without contact. So I know that they're using virtual reality as a training tool without contact to help increase, let's say, the ability to execute a play, if that makes sense. But I don't know if they're using it for TBI, but I, I think they should be. But I do, I've not seen it used in that capacity yet. Thank you. Uh, question for Dr. Flynn. Uh, you mentioned, you listed it was a uh, Fruit Ninja and then the uh, Beat Saber. And those are the games that most ad you would adhere to from the uh, children? <coughs> they, um, they expressed that they wanted to play those games in our sessions. And so, but did that necessarily yeah. mean that they were the most engaged cognitively? So is there, was there information on that? We don't have, we haven't processed that data yet. We're gonna look at motion and energy exertion. Um, in terms of like, we're still trying to figure out how we're gonna code, if we're gonna code cognitive engagement during this pilot study. Um, but they were able to play them, just anecdotally. Some of the other games were too difficult. The applications were too hard. There was too much going on with the controllers or the world. Um, but those two games were quite simple. There was not, um, there was only I think one, one child who really struggled to figure out, and we have it so that they can't fail, like in Beat Saber, and we have it, like we took the walls off, like, because like there's things that come at you that you have to kind of move out of the way. We took those off, uh, but we've only, um, but we only had to do that for one child to like make it as simple as possible where they, you know, we're just kind of doing this the whole time. But other than that, they were all able to play both of those games very, just like right away without any, any real difficulty. So, so in terms of engagement, you know, keeping them engaged in those games is pretty easy. Yeah. 